Topic 12, Atomic Structure, Volume 1, the uh, one and only. We look at experimental evidence to support some theories of emission spectra, ionization energy, and we discuss Planck's constant. The IB understandings covered for the higher level, Topic 12, talk about emission spectra and convergence. They talk about ionization energies, and we try and use some of the knowledge that we have of those to work them out. We also look at two equations which can be found in the data book and the text reference is page 85 to 92. So a very quick refresh of topic two in ionization energies. Remember ionization energies are a measure of the attraction between the nucleus and the outer shell electrons and the ionization energy is measured in kilojoules per mole. The data is on page eight. Key definition that you need to know Ionization energy, the minimum amount of energy required to remove a valence electron from a gaseous atom to form a gaseous ion. So if we have hydrogen gas, then we can ionize it to form a hydrogen ion in the gas phase M1 electron. In topic two, we talked about convergence and a line series. Now for an ionization, we would have an electron from the ground state that is promoted to the shell of infinity, all right? So it's basically lost from the outer shell. To do that, we need to heat up the atom. And when N equals infinity, that's when we say that that atom has been ionized because it is an unknown distance away from the nucleus. We know that at the higher energies, we have convergence of the energy levels and that allows us to calculate the ionization energy. A very, very quick refresh, remember that when, ion, when electrons are excited, they will release energy and return to the second shell, that is the visible line spectrum, and if excited electrons tr return to the ground state, that is the UV spectrum. So if we have a look at the trend in first ionization energies, of the element across period three, we see the existence of the main energy and sub energy levels. Now the main energy levels are the shells one, two, three, and four, and the sub energy levels are the S, P, F, and D subshells that we've talked about. A couple of notes for when we do these drawings. Remember that the greater the nuclear charge, the harder it is to remove an electron. And the sublevels are stable when they either half, empty, or full. And electrons prefer to be unpaired if possible. Pairing of electrons creates some repulsion. So let's have a look at sodium. And if we do the box diagram, we know that sodium has 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and it will be a 3s1. So it has one electron in the outer shell. Now, ionizing will cause that one electron in the 3s shell to be removed. We're going to pro promote that to the shell of infinity. It's got a core charge of plus one because it is in group one. So that electron is very easy to remove. If we remove that electron, we take away the whole third shell. It was a long, long way away to start off with, so it's easy to remove. Aluminium, on the other hand, is plus three in the nuclear charge and it has three electrons in the outer shell. Now that means it's got one electron in the 3p subshell. Now that one electron in the 3p, well, it's stable, but if aluminium was to lose that electron, it would then have an empty 3p subshell. And that is actually a little bit more stable. So it doesn't follow the trend because the trend would be, oh, that ionization energy should increase, but it doesn't. The other exception is sulfur. Sulfur has five, four electrons in its uh, 3p subshell. So that means it's just over half full. Now what sulfur could do is if sulfur loses one electron from the 3p, it will have a half full 3p subshell. And that's going to be slightly more stable than having that extra electron in there. So sulfur also doesn't follow the trend because it's actually easier to remove that electron than what we think because of the electron pair repulsion in the orbital. Remember an orbital can either have one, 
two or zero electrons. So in this case, those electrons are paired and it is actually easier to remove one of those um, than we think. So it doesn't follow the trend of increasing ionization energies as we go across period three. If we have a look at one atom and we look at its successive ionization energies, we can also see more evidence of the shells. So if we have a look at a sodium ionization energy, where we're removing every electron of sodium one by one, we can see that the, the trend describes the shells. Sodium has 11 electrons, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. So the first electron to be removed, the first ionization energy, will be this electron from the 3s, and that will be its outer shell. So it's a very easy electron to remove. So it has a low ionization energy. It doesn't take a lot of energy to remove that electron. That would be described as the first IE, the first ionization energy. Then we can see a really large increase in the ionization energy. So there's a big change, the little triangle, delta, change in energy. So that means that we're moving between a shell. We're no longer trying to take electrons out of the third shell, we're trying to take them out of a shell that's closer to the nucleus. In this case, the second shell. So the second ionization energy of sodium is trying to remove an electron from a full second shell. In fact, if we count those along, we can see all of the second shell electrons. And if we remove them one by one, they get harder and harder to remove. As we look further along the graph, we can see another big jump up to the first shell. So another big change in energy. So that's giving us more evidence of the inner shell, the first shell, shell number one, which can only hold two electrons. So they are the 1s2 and the 1s1 and 1s2 electrons of sodium. Now we need to talk about Planck's constant and the energy. Now we know that separate lines in an emission spectrum show the amounts of light, and as the lines become closer and closer together, we have what we call convergence. So the start of the continuum between which lines separate cannot be distinguished is called the convergence limit where we can no longer separate individual energies. Convergence limit. We can use the ionization energy data to determine the wavelength or the frequency of this convergence, which is what you'll be asked to do. So we have two important pieces of information from the data book. We have C equals mu times lambda. C is the speed of light, which is a constant, and that's given in the data book. 3.0 by times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Mu is the frequency, so the frequency of the light, and lambda is the wavelength, the wavelength of the light, which is measured in meters. The one underneath it is an equation with Planck's constant. So we have energy equals Planck's constant times the frequency. Planck's constant is also given in the data book, and it's 6.63 times 10 to the negative 4 joules per negative 34 joules per second. They're both in the data book on page 2. You just have to know when to use them correctly. E stands for the energy, and the energy will need to be in joules, which we'll talk about in a second. So here we're asked to calculate the wavelength of convergence. We've been talking about sodium, so we're going to focus on sodium. Sodium has a first ionization energy of 502 kilojoules per mole. Calculate the, calculate the wavelength for the limit of convergence observed in this spectrum. So whereabouts in the spectrum do the lines start to converge? So step one is we need to use the formula E equals Planck's constant times the frequency because we need to find the frequency. We've got the energy. The energy was the ionization energy, 502 kilojoules per mole. Planck's constant, we know, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34, and mu is what we want to find. 
Now we have some unit issues here. Our unit issues have to do with kilojoules per mole and joules. So we need to deal with those one at a time. The first one I'm going to deal with is the kilojoules. So I can multiply that by a thousand to remove the kilojoules. So I've got 503 times 10 to the 3 mole, mole per mole to the negative 1 equals Planck's constant times the frequency. Now to get rid of the mole to the minus 1, what I've got to do is divide by Avogadro's number. And this will be a key step that students miss. So I divide by Avogadro's number and that removes the mole to the minus 1 which leaves me with 8.34 times 10 to the negative 19, which equals Planck's constant times the frequency. Now what I want to do is simply just rearrange this expression to find the frequency. So I'll take Planck's constant to the other side, where we'll have 8.34 times 10 to the minus 19 over Planck's constant, and that will give us the value of the frequency in a unit called Hertz, HZ. That's the unit for frequency. I'm not sure that you'll ever be asked that, but the physics people will know exactly what that means. So the frequency is 1.26 times 10 to the 15 Hertz. After getting the frequency, then we're able to plug it into the Speed of light equals the frequency times the wavelength. And that will be the second step of this pro progress process. So, going to rearrange to find lambda, the wavelength. So that will be C over the frequency. C is the speed of light constant, 3.0 times 10 to the 8, divided by... The frequency that we just found, 1.26 times 10 to the 15. And this is going to give us an answer in metres. The wavelength will be in metres. 2.39 times 10 to the minus 7 metres. Now the question asked for the wavelength in nanometres. Now nano means times 10 to the minus 9. So what I have to do here is multiply this by 10 to the 9, and that will give me my unit in nanometers. So that is 239 nanometers, which is somewhere just in the ultraviolet section of the spectrum. That is where the lines in the sodium spectrum will converge. Okay, a couple of top tips for topic 12. Remember to use the data book, especially if there's a calculation involved. And don't forget to divide by Avogadro's number to get rid of the mole to the minus one. That'll be a key thing students miss.